any steel coming into the United States is going to have a 25% tariff. What about aluminum? Aluminum, too. President Donald Trump has shocked many countries by imposing 25% tariffs on aluminum. Prime Minister of Canada added, it also sent $9.40 billion worth of aluminum to the U.S. We'll be responding to the U.S. trade action with 25% tariffs. It's going to hurt the steel industry. This blows many countries and producers around the world, including India. I'll talk to Trump about that, but we're not backing off. Although aluminum is 8% of the Earth's crust, it takes a lot to extract, refine, and reinforce this metal, which we will show in this video. But China is the largest exporter of aluminum. Out of $220 billion worldwide, it exported $34.90 billion worth of aluminum to other countries in 2023. On the other hand, the United States of America is the largest importer of aluminum. The country imported $28.31 billion worth of aluminum in 2024. The U.S. aluminum smelting industry is small by global standards. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the total smelter capacity in the country was just 1.73% of the global total. It must be much more than that. Although Trump's tariff move seems more political, it could protect and revitalize American manufacturing. But what makes aluminum so important? Like every metal, aluminum is shiny and a very good conductor of heat and electricity. However, there are unique properties of this metal that make it more valuable than others. One of its amazing properties is lightweight. It gives aluminum an advantage over other metals. For instance, copper is a better conductor. To carry the same current as a copper wire, an aluminum wire needs to be 1.50 times thicker. But our overhead power lines have aluminum as a conducting material because the 1.50 times thicker aluminum still weighs two times lighter. This decreases the load on pylons and allows the spans between them to increase dramatically. It saves a lot of money on construction. However, power lines are largely composed of aluminum, mainly because aluminum is lighter in weight. This is why 13% of the world's aluminum is used by the energy sector. On the other hand, 23% of aluminum is used in the construction sector because this metal offers corrosion resistance and a high strength to weight ratio. This makes it a perfect material for exterior framing and roofing. Today, the aerospace industry uses aluminum to build aircraft, but it was not the case when the first aircraft was built. Back then, aluminum was not considered as strong as it is today. In fact, aluminum was weak and malleable then. This is why most of the aircraft built during the First World War were made out of lightweight wood. Although the Wright brothers used aluminum in their first aircraft, they used it for building the engine only. It was so difficult to refine this metal. On top of that, pure aluminum did not show promising strength results. So what changed everything? To understand this, let's jump to the step-by-step -step production process that major players employ these days. On Earth's crust, Aluminum exists in the form of aluminum oxide compounds, which largely can be found in a reddish-brown rock known as bauxite. Um, mining bauxite is simple. Typically, strip mining starts with a loud explosion. The rock formation breaks apart. Then, large mining excavators collect the blasted bauxite ore and load it onto heavy-duty mining trucks. Surface miners can also be employed to extract this aluminum-rich ore. These machines can cut and crush bauxite rocks using a special cutting drum. This stacker reclaimer is 410 feet long, weighs up to 1,300 tons, and is capable of extracting tons of bauxite in minutes. Some surface miners have a discharge conveyor that places the cut material alongside the machine. The loaded trucks take the bauxite to a crusher line. Mostly, crushers are installed above the open pit mine. They reduce the size of the mine material so impurities can be removed from it. For instance, a vibrating screen ensures that the right size of bauxite can get to the refining plant. Now, it's time to refine the extracted ore, which will give us aluminum oxide. It is widely known as alumina. For this, bauxite has to go through a process invented by Carl Joseph Bayer in 1888. It's called the Bayer process. This process is carried out in five steps. Let's see how it works. The crushed bauxite is first handled in a ball mill, Caustic soda or sodium hydroxide is also introduced in it. It produces slurry with a finely grained texture. This slurry is heated and turns into sodium aluminate in the digestion section. After heating, the slurry is discharged into a settler. It lets the completely developed sodium aluminate enter the decomposition plant while the bauxite residue, 
unreactive to lye, settles at the bottom. After lowering the sodium illuminate's temperature, crystal seeds are likewise included in the decomposing plant. The mixture is then constantly rotated for almost two days. This changes the sodium illuminate to granules of aluminum hydroxide. Finally, the aluminum is roasted enough that 98.60% of it becomes alumina suitable for smelting. It looks much like sugar used in baking, but is hard enough to scratch a pane of glass. Recently, Alcoa Corporation, an American company, came up with an innovative solution to refine bauxite. It is known as press filtration. It saves a significant amount of water and reduces the land that is needed to process bauxite in a typical way. The filtration plant processes the residue, which is primarily composed of red mud and coarse sand. The residue is pumped into the filter where plates compact it, removing approximately 70% of the moisture. The recovered water is then returned to the refinery's production process through a closed circuit. The waste that remains is like the moisture content in the soil, which is then transported by trucks to a new dry disposal area for further compacting. From the refining plant, the alumina is brought to a smelting plant. This is a place where the alumina powder will transform into a robust metal, which we know as aluminum. But first, it has to undergo several tests in the lab to ensure the quality. These tests include checking the size of the particles, which affects how well it dissolves in the smelter. The amount of alpha alumina is also measured because it impacts reactivity during electrolysis. Additionally, tests are done to see how easily alumina flows into cells and to check for moisture or other impurities that could cause problems during heating. These checks help ensure that only high-quality alumina is used for aluminum production, making the process more efficient and reliable. After quality assurance, the alumina has to go through the hall herald process. Before it, Alumina was mixed with sodium or potassium in a vacuum to obtain aluminum. It was a very expensive method. In 1886, two scientists, Charles Martin Hall in America and Paul Herol in France, developed this smelting method. Interestingly, both came up with the same thing in the same year while they were in different parts of the world. This is why it is known as the all herol process. And even after 150 years, all the premium aluminum is still produced through this same process. The processed and tested alumina is mixed with cryolite and other materials in large electrolytic cells called pots. A smelting facility can have several hundred pot lines. Raw alumina is fed into the pot and the electricity is passed across the carbon anode and into the cathode to create an electrolysis process. Oxygen atoms separate from the alumina and combine with the carbon anode leaving the remaining molten aluminum at the bottom of the pot. It results in molten aluminum and carbon dioxide. The emissions are carefully extracted and dry scrubbed before being released into the atmosphere. The molten aluminum, which generally has a temperature of 950 degrees Celsius, is dragged using a special equipment called a siphon. It transfers the aluminum into a special vessel known as a ladle. Carbon anodes are an essential part of the hall herol process but they get destroyed during this process. However, the damaged anodes can be recycled. Here, an operator is trying to take a damaged anode using this special machine. It is known as pot tending machines designed specifically for such industrial maintenance operations. The remains of the used anode are crushed so it can be recycled again. A continuous supply of new anodes is required to keep the process running. This is why carbon shops are built next to smelting plants. A carbon shop is a facility where a solid, rich material called petroleum coke is mixed to create carbon anodes. Typically, the carbon shop consists of three buildings, including a paste plant, a green plant, and a baking plant. First of all, the raw material is prepared in the paste plant. There, a paste of raw materials like calcined petroleum coke and coal tar pitch is created that will form the body of the anode. In the green plant, the paste is molded into preformed blocks before they are baked. Various machines are used for this purpose, including a sieving machine, a melting tank, a preheater, and a mixer. These unbaked blocks are also known as green anodes. They are cooled down and kept in storage for eight hours. After that, the green anodes are baked in the baking plant at high temperatures, typically around 1,120 degrees Celsius. Baking in these furnaces produces hard, durable anodes ready for use in electrolysis cells. Lastly, a layer of grade 89 aluminum in the form of liquid is sprayed on the ready anodes. Now they are ready to be transported to the smelting facility. 
This machine is transferring a batch of four anodes to the site. Smelting aluminum is an energy-intensive operation. Globally, nearly 70% of emissions from aluminum production arise due to electricity consumption during smelting. This is why aluminum smelting plants are strategically positioned near power sources to optimize energy efficiency. This proximity ensures a steady supply of electricity, crucial for the energy-intensive smelting process. Hydropower-based smelters are prevalent in areas with access to water resources suitable for generating clean energy. For instance, the Lockabear smelting plant is just 90 miles away from a hydroelectric dam located near Fort William in the Scottish Highlands. Likewise, two hydroelectric plants in Indonesia supply 426 megawatts of dedicated electricity to the Inalem smelting plant. The obtained aluminum is still molten and hot. It is the perfect time to give this metal a new shape. The molten aluminum is poured into molds where it solidifies to form the desired shape. Generally, it is transformed into ingots and billets. These casted ingots are 9 meters long and weigh more than 30 tons. These will be further furnished for their specific industrial use. For instance, the ingots will be sawn and scalped into 10-ton blocks for printing purposes, specifically. Next, these blocks are transformed into rolls. For this purpose, the ingots are preheated at 500 degrees Celsius to ensure that the outside and inside temperatures are equal. It is necessary to trim them down during the hot rolling process. After that, the preheated ingots are rolled using massive rollers. This reduces their thickness while maintaining ductility. A 10-ton ingot is just reduced to a 4-millimeter thick sheet, and lengthwise it measures approximately 1.5 miles. In the last stage of this process, the sheet is rolled onto a coil. A code is given to every aluminum coil after the hot rolling process. Looks like this coil is ready, but it is still hot, and it needs to be cooled down before it is processed in the cold rolling section. Cold rolling is done to further reduce the required thickness for the specific final use. The printing industry uses an aluminum sheet of thickness ranging from 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters. Next, the final coils are shipped to different parts of the world. At the Wiesbaden plant in Germany, the aluminum coil is finally transformed into a printing plate. This complete plate production line is 656 feet long. First of all, the aluminum sheet coil is unwound. Then, the surface of the aluminum is cleaned. It is called etching because the sheet is exposed to a chemical etchant, such as ferric chloride or an acid solution, which dissolves the unprotected metal. After that, the sheet experiences electrochemical graining. This process involves roughening the aluminum surface using alternating current and suitable electrolytes. It improves the adhesion of photosensitive layers and the retention of water in non-printing areas. Finally, there comes the coating process. A thermally sensitive coating is applied to the aluminum sheet. This layer will form the final image. A laser inspection device checks every single nanometer of aluminum as it exits the plant. Every non-standard plate is automatically identified and sorted during this procedure, and a visual inspection is conducted. Additionally, carried out are lithographic tests to guarantee clients exclusively operate with good quality printing plates before trimming to size. After a thorough examination, the covered aluminum is cut to the required size in the lion converting hall. Another last inspection is done at this point of the plate manufacturing process. The final size plates are covered with a protective covering to prevent them from hurting each other. Once again, everything is left to a competent level. Printing plates leaving the facility are wrapped in impermeable paper and delivered in light, tight, recyclable containers ready for use. There is nothing left for chance. However, printing is not the only industry that uses aluminum. You can see products made of aluminum everywhere. Approximately 15% of the aluminum produced worldwide is used for packaging purposes. Largely, the transportation industry uses this metal for making vehicle bodies, and it is used in almost every type of vehicle such as cars, trucks, trains, airplanes, rockets, and even ships, as well as submarines. Our building contains a lot of aluminum. However, pure aluminum is coming at the cost of GHG emissions. Aluminum production accounts for approximately 4% of global emissions. Decarbonizing the electricity used in aluminum production is crucial for reducing the industry's carbon footprint. There is a need to build and adopt new technologies such as the ELISIS. It replaces carbon anodes with inert anodes and eliminates direct carbon emissions from smelting. 
aluminum is non-toxic and possesses a high strength-to-weight ratio. You can 100% recycle it for infinite times. Our world might be different without this metal, and we might not be able to effectively store processed food, enjoy travel, and reach the TARS. That's all for today. Hope you enjoyed this informative video. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comment sections. Feel free to ask anything, share, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.